Welcome once again to another Bible class from the Spring Hill Church of Christ meeting at 405 Butler Street, Spring Hill, Louisiana. With this study, we are studying Judges chapter 17 through chapter 19, verse 21. Judges 17 through chapter 19, verse 21. At this point in Judges history, we are kind of at the end of the book of Judges. What, ha what we have today is considered an appendix to kind of give you an idea of life, normal life, during the time of Judges, what we have with this particular uh, study today, chapter 17, and then next lesson we'll be on uh, chapter 19, 22 through the end of the book, and then we'll get ready to start the book of Ruth. Once again, our chart that you're used to seeing, and there's our, there's our chart the book of Judges, and you see the seven cycle periods, I guess, for lack of a better word, where they would turn from God, God would put them into oppression, they would call out to God and repent, He would deliver them with a judge, raise up a judge, and they would be delivered, they would have peace for a number of years, and then go back and repeat the cycle. Judges, here is an overview from Bible Projects, and where we are today is Judges, beginning with Judges chapter 17 through 21. We had corruption of the judges we looked at up to this point, and now we are going to see firsthand the corruption of the people. How corrupt were they during this time period? 17 through 21 gives us that answer. And of course, we've looked at this chart several times, the judges uh, during this time period, the type of judge, whether they major, minor judge, they're, uh, the persecutor at the time, how many years of persecution, how many years of peace, and years of judgment and the reference. I, in past, have entitled this section, Anarchy Without a King, bookends of Judges chapter 17 through 21. We're going to talk today about Micah and the Danite uh, migration, chapter 17 through 18, and we'll, we might get into 19. 21. Notice in the beginning, 17 verse 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 17 verse 6. Chapter 19 verse 1, we have in those days when there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Beginning of this religious and moral deterioration. The end, toward the end, 18 verse 1, in those days there was no king in Israel. 21, 25, the very last verse of the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every one did what was right in his own eyes. So you understand the religious deterioration and the moral deterioration that goes on in this book. With that, let's look at these verses. I have 17 through 18. They should be through 19 verse 21. We'll do our best to get there. So as we begin to look at this, this again is considered 17 through 21, an appendix to the book of Judges. 
And we're going to start out looking at Micah and the Levite. The Levite, you know, being of the priestly tribe, and they were hiring Levites as personal priests during this time period. So let's look at chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, bless be my son by the Lord. And so we see this tells us he is from the hill country of Ephraim. If you look at this map of the tribe of Ephraim, we have Mount Gash and that area. And you look up above it, there's uh, Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal. So you get an idea that swath in the middle of the tribe would be considered the hill country. Continuing our reading, verse 3, he restored the thousand pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver, gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. So we see the people have no regard for God saying, you shall have no other gods before you, and you shall not make any graven images. They weren't paying any attention to, to that, the religious deterioration we see. The man Micah, verse 5, had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. <laughs> in those days, here we have that phrase, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judea of the family of Judah who was a Levite and he sojourned there uh, and we're told. In verse 8, the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim. We just pointed that out on the map to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judea and am going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, his own personal priest. And I will give you 10 pieces of silver a year, a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons, and Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. And then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite priest. Well, you know, God won't necessarily be with these people just because they have an outward appearance of being right. So now we, we're going to come up on the, the Danites. The Danites, uh, we're going to learn how they get into the north from where they were originally given land in uh, chapter 18. We get into this. So chapter 18, verse 1, beginning, In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. 
For until then, no inheritance among the tribes had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtal, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they said to them, Go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. Remember, he had been in that area. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? And he said to them, This is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. And they said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will be successful. And the priest said to them, go in peace, and the journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in uh, the earth and possessing wealth and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came to their brothers at Zora and Estal, their brothers said to them, what do you report? And they said, arise and let us go against them for we have seen the land and behold, it is very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go to enter and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So 600 men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah to Eshtal and went up and encamped at Kareth jerem in Judah, and on this account, that place is called Mahandan to this day. Behold, it is west of Kareth Jerome. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to scout out the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod, household gods, a carved image, and a metal image? Now, therefore, consider what you will do. And they turned and aside there and came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Dan and asked him about his welfare. The 600 men uh, of the Danites armed with their weapons of war stood by the entrance of the gate and the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up, entered, took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with 600 armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, what are you doing? And they said to him, keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest to the house of it is better, he says, is it better for you to be a priest to the house of one man or be a priest to the tribe and a clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod, the household gods, the carved image, and went along with the people. So they turned and departed, put the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them, and when they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out and they overtook the people of Dan and they shouted to the people of Dan who turned around and said to Micah, what is the matter with you that you come with such a company? And he said, you take my gods that I made and the priest and go away and what I have I left how then do you ask me, what is the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you and you lose your life with the lives of your household. And then 
the people of Dan went, went their way. And when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. And the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him. They came to Laish to a people quiet and unsuspecting, struck them with the edge of the sword, burned the city with fire, and there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dwelling with anyone. It was in the valley that belonged to Beth Rahab, and then they rebuilt the city and lived in it, and they named the city of Dan after uh, the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel, but the name of the city was Laish at first. And the people of Dan set up carved images for themselves, and Jonathan the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. That would be the around 722, 721 B.C. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. So this is how religiously deteriorated the people had become and the moral deterioration. They were practicing the old adage, might makes right, what is mine is yours, I will take it. And that's what they did. Now, chapter 19, we get into another story of the Levite and his concubine. We begin this story. We'll begin this story, and then we'll finish this story in our next lesson. But chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, in those days when there was no king in Israel, See, we're still told that when this time period is, it's sometime between Judges chapter 1, Judges chapter 16, these events occurred. There was no king in Israel. A certain Levite, now not necessarily this Levite we were talking about, but here's another Levite, was sojourning in a remote part of the hills of Ephraim. We already looked on, on the tribal map where these hills were. And he had a concubine who was unfaithful to him. And so, of course, a concubine didn't have all the legal rights of a wife. But, of course, the concubine was for his convenience, for his sexual gratification, for anything else the household might need concubines were, were that. But this concubine, it says, was unfaithful to him. She went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judea and was there some four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. Now, she considered him a husband, although to him she was just a concubine. Kind of the way this worked. And he wanted to bring her back. So he had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys, and she, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. So they ate, drank, spent the night there. And on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning, and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and after that you may go. So the two of them sat down, ate, drank together. The girl's father said to the man, be pleased to spend the night, let your heart be merry. And when the man rose up to go, his father-in-law pressed him until he spent the night there. So he's overstaying what his intended time was. And this is going to come back to haunt him, we're going to see. On the fifth day, he's ready to depart early. The girl's father said, strengthen your heart and wait until the day declines. So I'm sure he's lonely wants to spend more time with his daughter. And so they ate, both of them. And when the man and his concubine and his servant rose up to depart, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Behold, now the day has waned toward evening. Please spend the night. Behold, the day draws to its close. 
said, lodge here, let your heart be merry, and tomorrow, <laughs> here we go, always tomorrow, you shall rise early in the morning for your journey and go home. But the man could not spend the night. He rose up, departed, and arrived opposite Jebus, that is the Jerusalem, what the name is now. It was a Jebusite city, and they called it Jebus, remember? He had with him a couple saddled donkeys, and his concubine was with him. And when they were near Jebus, the day was nearly over, and the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. Now notice, we're going to notice the moral conditions of these people now. Because look at his servant is well aware of this, and he says to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to this city of the Jebusites, spend a night. And his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibba. Now, remember, Gibba came into play. The Gibeonites, remember, with Joshua and how they tricked them uh, into an alliance and so forth. Verse 13, <clears throat> And he said to his young man, Come, let us draw near to one of these places, spend the night at Gibba or Ramah. And so they passed on, went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibba, which belongs to Benjamin, and they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibba. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city, for no one took them into his house to spend the night. And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field, and the man was from the hill country of Ephraim. And he was sojourning in Gibba, and the men of the place were Benjamites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going? Where do you come from? And he said to him, we are passing from Bethlehem in Judea to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come. And I went to Bethlehem in Judea and am going to the house of the Lord, but no one has taken me into his house. And said, we have straw. We have feed for our donkey with bread and wine for me and your female servant and your young man with your servants. There is no lack of anything. And the old man said, peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. He knew how bad the situation would be in the square at nighttime. So he brought him into his house, gave the donkeys feed, and they washed their feet and they ate and drank. Now we'll leave the story there for this lesson, and we'll continue on next week as we will begin to look at chapter 19, verse 22, and we'll go all the way through to the end of the book of Judges as we'll finish in our next lesson. So with that, cheery old mate, Bob Sherlock. God's plan for saving man in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible tells us, therefore, by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of some work that we would do, that we would devise. But it's God's work. God has a plan of salvation for man. The first thing, of course, is to hear the gospel. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. John 8, 32. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. Then we learn we must believe the gospel. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who would come to God must believe he is. He's the rewarder of him that diligently seeks him. Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts chapter 8 and 37, the Ethiopian eunuch was told, If you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. 
Repentance of sin is important. A change of life, a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of attitude. Luke 13, 3, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts 17 and 30, we learn, truly the time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why is that? Because he is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance to us by raising him from the dead. We learn that repentance, in this case, we learn repentance is very important. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his slackness. He says that, that he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Confession is important. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father in heaven. We learn in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. We learn about the confession that the Ethiopian eunuch made in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37 when he was, uh, he said, if you believe, you may. And he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then we're to be baptized for the remission of our sins. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, we learn there that Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. First Peter 3.21, Even baptism doth also now save us, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Acts 22 and verse 16, Saul of Tarsus was told, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Galatians 3, 27. We learn that we're buried into Christ. We're clothed with Christ. We learn in that passage of Scripture in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. He says, do you not know as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, you were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so you must also walk in newness of life. God's plan of salvation for man is to hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and be buried in baptism for the remission of your sins. If you found this video helpful and wish to learn more, be sure you download the note card that goes with this lesson and our free four-lesson Bible correspondence course. You will find the links in the description below. We here at the Spring Hill Church of Christ meeting at 405 Butler Street in Spring Hill, Louisiana, want to help you with your growth and your knowledge of God's Word. Remember, we are in it for the likes and the subs, so be sure to like us, subscribe to our channel, and tell others. Thanks for watching. In the meantime, in between time, we will see you next time. Cheerio, mate. And with that, Bob's your uncle.